pathology, what we do is we examine that tissue under the microscope. So that means we take the, the tissue that the surgeon has removed from your body and look at what is the disease process that's happening. And in general terms, what I call it is angry cells. When you are having some symptoms or something, your cells are getting angry and they get angrier and angrier. And whether they develop into something like bone loss or they develop into something like a cancer, it's going to vary for individuals. But at the end of the day, they're angry cells. If we can simplify it in terms that people can understand. If you haven't done so already, go ahead and click that subscribe button down below. It's a little red button. You punch that and it's going to notify you every time we put out a new episode that can help you improve your bone health. And then also, if you haven't done so already, head over to bonecoach.com, sign up for the free seven day osteoporosis kickstart. That's going to walk you through everything you need to be doing right now to get on the path to improvement and stronger bones. After you do those two things, go ahead and press play on this episode and I'll see you inside. Welcome, welcome to this episode of The Bone Coach Show. Joining us today to explore bone health under the microscope and functional culinary medicine is Manisha Benot. Dr. Manisha Benot is the founder of Wellcula. She is a quintuple board-certified physician and best-selling author with expertise in integrative medicine, functional culinary medicine, cytopathology, and anatomic clinical pathology. After graduating from Binghamton University with dual degrees in chemistry and Asian studies, she earned her medical degree and completed training at NYU Winthrop University Hospital. This was followed by three fellowships in cytopathology at Cornell, breast, bone, and soft tissue cancer at the University of Rochester, and integrative medicine at the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine, Arizona. Dr. Minot has additional training certifications in mindfulness-based stress reduction, plant-based nutrition, culinary medicine, Ayurveda, yoga for cancer recovery, and a yoga medicine therapeutic specialist. She applies a whole body approach to healing. She's a sought after health and wellness expert providing both speaking and written commentary to multiple news media outlets and publications. And her interests include nutrition, the microbiome, the role of stress and inflammation in disease manifestation, and applying mindfulness as a lifestyle practice in disease prevention. Dr. Bernot's mission is to support an integrative approach to evidence-based holistic well-being. Dr. Misha, welcome to the show. Thank you, Kevin. I'm really looking forward to uh, talking to you today um, because there's not often I get to share some of this uh, stuff we're going to talk about today. I'm really excited about this. I'm looking forward to it because we're going to do something for everybody listening. We're going to do something that we've never done before on this show. And uh, Dr. Manisha is absolutely the person to help walk us through and guide us through our bone health under a microscope. And before we get into that, I would love for you to explain your background a little bit and why you're able to speak, uh, you know, from such a an educated background on this topic. Yeah, so you, you've already mentioned my all my degrees. So clearly I like school, but that's not really true. What I actually like is understanding the human body and how the human body works and the machinery that's really within all of us and how to optimize that. So with all of my different trainings, I've really been able to take a chance to look under the microscope at your entire body on this cellular level. And what I've learned from that is really what I now apply for helping patients take care of themselves because we think that we have no power over our health, and we actually have a lot more power than we we realize we have. So um, I've looked at your cells, I, I've looked at your biopsies, your amputations, so many different parts of the human body under that microscope in living people, by the way. These are all people who are, who are living, and they have to have biopsies or, or different tissues taken out. And in pathology, what we do is we examine that tissue under the microscope. So that means we take the, the tissue that the surgeon has removed from your body and look at what is the disease process that's happening. And in general terms, what I call it is angry cells. When you are having some symptoms or something, your cells are getting angry and they get angrier and angrier. And whether they develop into um, something like bone loss or they develop into something like a cancer, it's going to vary for individuals. But at the end of the day, they're angry cells, if we can simplify it in terms that people can understand. So when I'm looking at your cells, I'm going, are these happy cells? Are these like 
kind of cranky cells or are they outright, they've got some anger issues and we need to address them, right? But the part people don't realize is they can actually start a lot earlier. And preventative medicine has always been the mes best medicine, but we often wait until we have that anger from ourselves telling us to go back and prevent stuff. And, and so, because if somebody's coming in to get a biopsy of their tissue, there's usually a reason why they're going to do that because they've found something in their blood work or their lab work or something else, right? Yeah. So depending on what part of the body we are talking about, so people who go in for their annual colonoscopies, the doctor might find a polyp there that they need to get examined under the microscope. A woman who goes in for a mammogram might um, need to get a um, breast lesion biopsy to determine if it's malignant or not. An individual who might be uh, getting sur um, surveillance for some kind of cancer they have um, might do a PET scan and then other things light up in their bone and they might have metastatic disease in their bone. So there, there's many ways that these things can come up. Sometimes it's something like somebody was in a car accident and they got a chest x-ray um, to see if they had a pneumothorax. And instead, they find a lung mass there. And then they're like, oh, this lung mass is metastatic. Where did it come from? So there's so many ways that a, people, a person could end up getting a sample done. But at the end of the day, it all comes back to how can we take care of our body ourselves as much as possible? Absolutely. And, and you know, me being someone who had a father who passed away from cancer at a really young age, that was always a concern for me throughout my life too. Uh, and I've done some preventative testing just to get those things checked, you know, some blood work. And even I went and I got this scan done. I, I don't know if you've ever heard of Pernuvo before. Yeah. Uh, I went and I got this Pernuvo scan done. And fortunately that showed that there wasn't anything there to, to be concerned about, which was great. But I would think that if something does show up, that's that's the point at which you're probably going to be seeing someone uh, in some form, right? Or at least in your previous work. Um, in my previous work, so in certain uh, diseases, it, it is more advanced, but some of these changes we will see actually earlier um, in uh, dysplastic cases of maybe cervical pap smears or maybe somebody who has reflux disease and we're seeing changes in their uh, GE junction. So there is a certain progression for many of these, these diseases that is happening on this microscopic cellular biochemical level that sometimes people tend to ignore the symptoms because they can't relate that maybe their headache is linked to their gut issues and their gut issues are linked to what they're eating and their lifestyle. So we often don't connect or connect to these dots because we don't realize. So I, I'm kind of the person who who looks at your whole trajectory and connects all the dots for you and goes, oh, well, th this was happening 20 years ago. So probably there were some underlying cell changes that were happening because it's not often that cancers just develop overnight. There's a, there's a process that's happening over time. And the same thing for bone health and osteoporosis it does not develop overnight. This is a lifetime journey, right? So the uh, the sooner we realize how we can take care of our health is how we want to um, really move forward. Now, I'm really looking forward to some of the things that we're gonna talk about today. And just, I wanna, I wanna make everybody aware that if you're watching this on bonecoach.com, you're watching the video or you're on YouTube or something like that, and you're watching the video, there are some images that we are gonna show that if you're a little squeamish, you might not wanna watch or you might wanna turn your eyes away, but you can absolutely follow along and listen on the podcast or you can listen wherever you're at and you'll still be able to get the same exact benefit out of this. And if you're just curious as to what we're showing and talking about, feel free to watch that on the, uh, the YouTube channel or on bonecoach.com. And you've seen, you were just talking about, you've seen under the microscope, you've seen bone cells under the microscope, right? And you've seen all the other pieces of bone that play into that. Are you open to just walking us through each of those pieces and things that you've seen? Yes, absolutely. So I've actually created some images for you and I'm going to describe these images because 
I really want you to, um, in a way, understand that there is a lot at play here when it comes to your uh, bone health. And if you're so, listening on the podcast, just know there's a video on our website at bonecoach.com. You go, you look at that, and it's going to show you exactly what uh, Dr. Manisha is pointing out here. Yeah. So your bone is actually a very specific type of specialized connective tissue. And that connective tissue is composed of a um, intercellular calcified matrix. And that bony matrix is made up of three types of cells. And you may have heard these terms before. They're made up of osteoblasts. And you can think of osteoblasts as the ones that build the cells, build the bone um, cells, uh, bone matrix. Then they're also made of osteoclasts with a C. Those are the ones that chew up the matrix. And the, we consider them the ones that resorb the matrix as it's damaged. And then you have the osteocytes. And this is where your mature bone cells, um, they're more of like this spider, uh, spider shape, and they maintain that matrix for us, that, uh, that matrix. And the bone in itself is also lined. So this matrix you have is lined by something called endosteum. So that's the inner lining. And then the outer lining, which is periosteum. So that's kind of this um, graphic image that I'm showing you there. But what does that look like under the microscope? Under the microscope, this basically looks like purplish, pinkish, bluish cells to us. And that's not what the actual color of your cells are. This is a stain that we use called hematoxylin eosin in order to um, really bring out the features of the different uh, bone cells. So uh, the ones that are, are being shown in this image here, the osteoblasts are the ones that member um, laid down the bone and build the bone and there there's lots of those there and, and they're represented in in these kind of uh, long like cells that are lining the bony matrix then you have the osteocytes that i mentioned that are within the matrix so they're they're holding that matrix together hey it's bone coach kevin ellis i want to take one more minute to talk about if you are somebody who was newly diagnosed with osteopenia or osteoporosis and you're at a point where you're stressed you're worried you're overwhelmed you have no idea where to start or how to get started getting confident in your plan i want to tell you about the stronger bone solution program over 5,000 people have come through this stronger bone solution program and it walks you through the exact process you need to fill in the missing pieces, uncover critical things in your plan that you may not be aware of, and help you make modifications, adjustments, and tweaks to get you to the place where you're building stronger bones. I want you to get confident in your plan so that you can focus on living life and enjoying the life that you deserve with the people you love most. So if that's where you wanna be, head over to bonecoach.com forward slash apply and apply for our Stronger Bone Solution program right now. I'm Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. I want to see you inside this program. I want to help you get on the path to improvement and stronger bones. Hope to see you inside very soon. Let's get back to the episode. So what is really happening in bone diseases, depending on which bone diseases we might be talking about? So as I know on um, this podcast with the Bone Coach, you're also often talking about osteoporosis. And osteopenia is the precursor to osteoporosis. But what are we seeing under the microscope? So often when somebody um, gets a, uh, they, they have a fall and they fracture their hip bone. So that is a dislocate, uh, not a dislocation. It's a disconnection of a fracture between the femoral head and the femur bone, right? So we often get in the pathology lab, a femoral head and uh, we get the gross specimen. And I really, I really should have pulled up a gross specimen for you to look at, but it basically looks like a femoral head and it has very jagged edges because it broke at the neck of your femur bone. And when it breaks there, it's often very hemorrhagic. So we want to know what is the cause of this breakage? Why did this bone break? And more often the cause is osteoporosis, meaning weakened bones, right? And we want to see how bad is that osteoporosis? And we look at it under the microscope and a normal femoral head under the microscope will have very thick bone, okay? It would have a very thick matrix of bone. Whereas one that has osteopenia, thin bone, or osteoporosis, the bone actually gets much 
thinner under the microscope where it's getting replaced instead of matrix by fat. So can you imagine trying to stand on a, a fatty bone um, and trying to stand and be stable versus a hard bone structure, a matrix, right? So that's what's happening. The other thing we're looking at under the microscope is also to make sure it, there wasn't a metastatic disease that um, there was a tumor that infiltrated that bone. And that was the reason it caused the fracture, right? So these are the, these are the couple of things that we're looking at when your orthopedic surgeon brings you in and he says, okay, it's time to put in a hip replacement and I'm going to put in this metal rod and, and you're going to have a brand new hip. Well, it doesn't end there because that, that femoral head that the surgeon takes out ends up in my pathology lab. And I'm looking at it to go, what other answers can I give this person? Because I want them to know that if they have osteopenia or osteoporosis or they have something going on in their, in their hip bone, guess what? On the other side, if they haven't had that hip replacement, eventually that one will break too. So we want to help them with tools that how can they strengthen their bone, right? So that's, that's one um, entity. And I know that's one that your audience is very familiar with. The, the second one that you may hear and maybe people feel is um, uh, something called degenerative joint disease. And this is where people might feel like, oh, my joints hurt, my, my knees hurt, my hips hurt when I move them. And it's because the uh, bone is rubbing against bone because the cartilaginous area, which um, when you look at the image, it's actually getting beaten up. So instead of it being nice, smooth cartilage, it gets beaten up and gets very ragged on the surface. And then eventually that that cartilage thins out and disappears even more that now you've got bone on top of bone. And when you move your body, it really hurts, right? One of the things people don't realize is cartilage does not have a good blood supply. Okay. So how do you send nutrients to your cartilage? You send nutrients to your cartilage by moving your body. But what do people do when their body is, hurts for movement? They stop moving. So they're contributing to this degeneration even further in their joints. And this is where we see a lot of knee replacements. Um, and even still, hip replacements will happen with degenerative joint disease. Other ones that you might hear about, maybe you heard about a friend who had to get their toe biopsy or heel biopsy or something like this. And th this is an entity that we often see in individuals who have diabetes because they, they have uh, wounds that they can develop on their um, joints, specifically in their feet, and they get infected. And it's very often we see a lot of amputations in individuals with uncontrolled diabetes. And what happens? These inflammatory cells invade the bone and they basically replace what's there with inflammatory cells. Definitely not a fun thing to have. And please, Kevin, stop, stop me if there's something you want me to add more of, because I know this is a very unusual way of sharing, but... No, this is fantastic. I mean, if you have... These are great examples. Not only are you talking through it so people can understand it, and I'm sure people are fascinated about some of these things that you're talking about right now, but also they can, if you're watching it on, on bonecoach.com, they can see too what you're sharing on the screen as well. Any other conditions too uh, that you yeah. see under the microscope that you think are important to touch on? I, I think there's a few ones that, that might be a little bit interesting. So um, gout. Okay, so gout can get aggravated by certain foods that you eat, right? But what's happening in your, your toe, your big toe, or whatever, or maybe in your knees or wherever you're getting those gouty attacks is there's actually crystals in there that are in the bone that can be quite painful that you're feeling, right? So it's not a normal process of what normal bone would look like. So all these things are happening all the time and if you understand that oh these crystals are caused by high uric acid and and these foods and this diet and this lifestyle that i'm living contribute to that you'd be like maybe you don't want those in there because you don't really need to have them in there it's not it's not like an end all be all right another um interesting one now this one um that i'm showing you is, is quite a graphic one 
But this is something that happens more in younger individuals and more often than we think. And this is an individual who had osteosarcoma. Usually we see that in individuals between 10 to 30 years of age, and it is a cancer. And we don't really know why this cancer happens, but you can think of it as there's mutations that happen over time and the person develops this cancer. This per this individual had to get their entire um, femor entire femur actually removed. So here you can see some remnants of a femoral head at the top and, and then the tumor is pretty much replacing a majority of the bone. And not only that, it's invading into the fat and the muscle, the soft tissue around the bone. Um, and this individual actually, unfortunately, this is a recurrence because you can also see a rod in here because he previously had a little bit of tumor removed and that required in order to stabilize that. Remember I said metastatic tumor can result in a fracture. So in order to stabilize the bone, they put a rod in. But now this tumor came back with a vengeance. And um, so this was one of his amputations. Uh, the other thing to consider is that there's other types of tumors that can happen. Remember the bone, the the femur, this area of the body that we're talking about, or bones just in general, also have cartilage. Like I already mentioned, degenerative joint disease and cartilage. But inside, you can have cartilaginous tumors. So this is a specific type of sarcoma seen in a femoral head that shows a chondrosarcoma. So it's a cartilage tumor, and under the microscope. What do we see? We see instead of regular bone, it's been replaced by malignant cartilage. Once again, not a normal process. And then the last one I'm gonna show you is quite a graphic one, but this is somebody who had to get their foot amputated. So this is a foot placed on its upside down. And if what we did was we took the foot and we took bisected it from, which I mean bisect means kind of cutting it in half to look at the soft tissue mass that was on the underlying surface, like on the sole of his foot. And this ended up being a liposarcoma, which is a type of soft tissue sarcoma that's made out of the fat cells. I guarantee that that person was walking around with this thing under his foot, not for a day, not for a year, for quite a bit of time. And he just ignored it because he's like, oh, it's I just probably bruised. I did something. Didn't want to go to the doctor. Didn't want to deal with it. But by waiting too long to deal with something, you also allow it to grow more and more. So those were just a few of the images that, you know, you know, I just came to mind that I'm like, let me just show people because what's really happening is your cells are getting angry. And as they change over time, things can happen and different things are going to happen to different individuals. But what we can do is we can look at what are the things that we can control like what are these chemical processes what are these kind of breakdown things that are going on that was really really interesting we've never had somebody share this before or actually have that perspective uh, uh that you do as a as a pathologist has actually looked at these things under the microscope and seen so many examples of them so that was that was really really interesting okay so we and we saw the end result some people that did see it if you didn't see it and you you are you your stomach is maybe not as strong you might not want to watch the actual videos themselves but if you're listening to this uh, i'm sure this next part that we talk about could be just as helpful also which would be we just saw the end result and what may have to happen in certain situations if a person gets to that end result how do we prevent that end result from happening right like are there certain diagnostic tests that we could or should be looking at up front that could maybe help us prevent from getting to that point uh, after we make some lifestyle changes and things like that. Uh, yeah, ab absolutely. So um, diagnostic tests, obviously, um, most people are familiar with doing a, a bone DEXA scan, right? So when you're dealing with osteopenia or osteoporosis or, or just at that age. But I want you to even think earlier because I, I have a wide range of patients that that I work with. And what I'm looking at is all their processes in their body, all the chemical reactions that happen. So I'm looking at their status of their vitamins, their minerals, their macronutrients, their micronutrients. I'm looking at the diet they're eating. And I can tell you 99% of people come to me and say, oh, my diet's great. I eat really, really good. And then when we sit down and go over their diet, plus 
their blood work that shows how deficient they are in the basic ingredients to make cellular processes work. And it's not just the cellular processes in the bone, it's the entire body, right? So how do you make your cells make DNA, make um, energy, make all these things that they're basically overfed and undernourished. Like we are a malnourished environment that we're living in because yes, we might be eating, but we're not giving the body the ingredients it needs to really thrive. And that's the big shocker for people because when we sit down and really go through it, they're like, oh my God, I thought I was really doing well. And now I understand why I my DEXA scan came back that way. Now I understand. So, so then they have tools to actually move forward. And what are some of the, I want, I want to talk about functional culinary nutrition in just a minute, but what are some of the specific nutrients that you see that are really important for our health, for our cells, for our bones? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm looking at, so most people are familiar with calcium, you know, for bone health, right? Vitamin D for bone health. Then um, we also want to consider our vitamin K. We want to consider phosphorus. We want to also consider something that people don't often talk about, which is your phytonutrients, okay? So there are certain phytonutrients, phyto means plant, nutrients, which can influence bone resorption, like the chewing up of the bone, and bone deposition, or the building of the bone, right? And these come from our polyphenols, our plant-based ingredients. And often when, when I sit down and I, and I see, and when I have my patients do their food journals and stuff, they're eating the same breakfast, same lunch, same dinner, for decades, um, the lack of a variety and biodiversity that is happening. So um, some of those um, polyphenols that maybe people are now starting to hear about might include things like Revestrol, curcumin, which is found in turmeric. I mean, I've been eating that since I was a child. Genistin, which um, is found in soy foods. Uh, I'm shocked that, you know, in, in America, people really don't incorporate soy that much quercetin, which became popular in the, in the last few years because of our recent um, uh, outbreak that we had of um, things. But quercetin has been important for a long time. And where do you get that? Onions, red leaf lettuce, asparagus, um, fruits and teas. And it, it's that variety. And they actually showed that there was a study, in, uh, and mind you, the study was done in mice, that showed that, that having quercetin 2.5% quercetin for four weeks actually increased bone density and it improved that cortical and trabecular bone. So that matrix there and that microstructure in the mice. Um, it also helped increase calcium, right? Serum calcium, right? Because what happens with our standard American diet is we actually lose a lot of calcium because we're doing very high protein, high caffeine, processed food. So we're actually losing the calcium. So these more natural foods um, help. Another um, uh, polyphenol would be um, something like luteolin. So luteolin is another one and that's found in celery, chamomile, right? So how often are you having chamomile tea? How often are you having celery? And what this does is it reduces the inflammatory chemicals. So Inflammation in our body is obviously a contributing factor to a lot of chronic diseases, including osteoporosis. Camphorol, that's another one that's found in spinach and kale and broccoli, uh, promotes bone formation. My patients are eating iceberg and romaine and going, yep, I'm having my one salad a week. Like this is accumulation. This is not what you do some of the time. This is what you do most of the time. There's another one. It's uh, something with an N. Let me see. Uh, N Nigrin, something like that. It's another polyphenol. And this one is found in cherries. So when it's cherry season, have your cherries. It's also found in citrus fruits. And this can help reduce that urinary excretion of calcium because that that becomes a problem for people. They're like, oh, but now I have this, this thing. But it's not just about what you add in on. Um, it's also the other things that you're having, right? So if you're adding the good stuff, but you're still continuing to have the stuff that is making you lose the 
calcium, you're pretty much negating the effect. So then a year later, when you go to do your DEXA scan, there's not going to be a change, right? So you, you need to see what your overall is doing. But there, there is one thing that from a cellular level that all those ingredients that I just mentioned, all those polyphenols, what they do is they're working on this deep kind of cellular level with messengers in our body. And I, and I don't know if anybody has talked about rankle. Has anybody talked about rankle? Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I just want to make sure I'm not repeating myself. No, you're, but... <laughs> yeah, you're good. So rankle is basically, it, it's it's an abbreviation for a um, type of receptor um, for bone health, specifically for bone health. And when we're thinking osteoporosis, osteopenia, and it's, it's this messenger that tells the body for that we need more bone formation or we need more bone resorption. And it's a very fine balance of what this receptor does. And so you can kind of think of the receptor as, let me give you an example that might might make it a little bit easier to understand. So if you're on the dance floor, because I, I remember, Kevin, you like to dance. So I'm going to give you a dance floor um, uh, example. So you're on the dance floor and there's the DJ. Okay, we'll call him DJ Sammy, but he's actually DJ Rankle. Okay. And he is playing his music and he's having people come on the dance floor. But then when a song changes, people have to go off the dance floor, right? So there's a fine balance between bone formation and bone resorption, okay? And that's what the DJ Rankle controls, all right? So how does it control it and how does it get these messages? Well, it gets these messages from hormones. So hormones in your body, so when your estrogen goes down, the messages might change, all right? So when estrogen decreases in the body, um, the rankle activity actually increases. The DJ starts playing more music, basically, and that causes more bone to be broken down. When there is more inflammation in the body um, from other factors, maybe your lifestyle, your diet, what you're doing, other diseases, comorbidities you might have, that causes the DJ to play more music. And then what does he do? He helps break down the bone because now there's lots of people on the dance floor because the music's so great, right? What happens with a physical activity when you kind of abuse, like maybe instead of having a well-balanced workout, you're only doing weightlifting or you're only doing cardio and you're not doing any stretching and you create that mechanical force. What happens? That receptor gets upregulated causing a change. Maybe vitamin D deficiency, right? So if you don't have enough vitamin D in your body and you don't have enough calcium in your body, these nutrients can affect how the DJ works, right? So, so and, and then we can't forget medications. People are on medications and sometimes they don't remember even why they're on them. They go to the doctor, they get their medications, right? And medications is the first place we should always look for what are some of the adverse effects. So medications can also um, influence this. So in essence, this is a really fine kind of balance on our bone dance floor, in our cells, all this stuff that's happening. And um, we actually have a lot more control over it than we think. So. Yeah. And there is a medication called Prolia that is a rank ligand inhibitor. That is a rankle inhibitor. And uh, that that's a medication that does have some side effects and short and long-term implications of use. And you can't just start it and come off because you can, it, when you stop it, it can increase that activity level of cells that break down bone really, really fast. And that can increase your risk of vertebral fractures. So uh, 100%. yeah. And, and you touched on something that was really interesting, which was uh, before we even talked about the the example with DJ Sammy and the uh, mm -hmm. and the rankle, it, you were talking about the lack of nutrient variety and diversity and the importance of antioxidants and polyphenols and all these things. Uh, I I think that's so important, and I agree. I see this all the time: people eating the same thing day in and day out, not switching things up going to whole foods, grabbing the same thing every day. I can tell you those things that are in whole foods, <clears throat> you still need some diversity 
from from those things because they're grown in the, in these massive areas a lot of times that are just continue to be harvested over and over and over. You're not getting all the nutrients that you probably need. So I would even switch it up and go to your local farmer's markets too, right? Go to your local farmer's markets, eat seasonally, sometimes make some rotations and adjustments like that. And one of my favorites for adding in other antioxidants and is I, we love berries and we love getting frozen berries too. We'll get like lingonberries, we'll get uh, wild blueberries and my kids just love eating those in little dessert bowls after dinner. Hey, it's Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of The Bone Coach Show. If you're finding it helpful, please leave a positive rating and review. Hit that like button, subscribe to the podcast or the channel. That lets us help more people and reach and serve more people. And it also lets us know that this is helpful to you on your journey to better health and stronger bones. And then also, right down in the show notes, you can actually find a link to my free bone healthy recipes guide that's going to give you access to some amazing and delicious recipes to support your journey to stronger bones and then also we have a link to my free stronger bones masterclass in the show notes too and that is the three-step process that has helped people in over 1500 cities around the world get confident in their plan for stronger bones over 110,000 people have have taken part in this and it's been really really helpful for them and i want you to have free access to it too so add your name and email right down there in the show notes get access to that free stronger bones masterclass and let's get you confident in your stronger bones plan today uh, let's talk about functional culinary medicine because uh, most people have never heard of that and you kind of coined this term and I'd love for you to expand on it a little bit more. Yeah, so we can look at functional culinary medicine as really integrating what we know about functional medicine, which is getting to the root cause of health issues, and then culinary medicine, which is looking at what foods can influence your health. And, and not only that, how can we incorporate them in our day, right? Because there might be a cultural thing that there's certain foods you like to eat. Um, there might be a certain limitation to maybe I, I'm finding a lot of people don't even know how to cook, which is why I do cooking classes. Um, because that if, if you don't know how to cook and feed yourself properly, that, that's going to be a challenge unless you have a chef who's able to make food for you all the time. So it's really taking that, all right, the underlying cause of maybe my bone issues or my osteopenia is that one, um, I have low vitamin D, one, I have low calcium absorption, I might have gut issues, you know, so I have all these things. How can I now take some recipes and incorporate it so I can bring those up without necessarily going first step is medicine? What can I do myself? And even if that step is medicine, just because you're taking a medicine does not mean you stop doing all these other lifestyle things. I think what happens often is a person goes on medicine, goes, oh, I'm going to be fine now. No, your bone is going to continue and your other diseases are going to continue unless you make some basic lifestyle changes. So when we're thinking about bone health, the dietary issues, obviously, I've already mentioned low vitamin D intake, low calcium intake low vitamin K intake, high animal protein, um, you know, th this whole, I got to eat my 75 grams of protein. Otherwise, I'm not going to be full. Sometimes, depending on the type of protein can influence it. Excess sodium. We have way too much sodium in our um, microwave dinners, right? The, the ones we stick in the microwave for lunch that are very quick. If you look, the amount of sodium compared to the amount of nutrients is very high. Individuals also have a low magnesium intake, and that's partially because our food supply is also low in magnesium. Um, so, and then we actually have too much phosphorus intake. I just think about all those people with their diet sodas or what at regular sodas, even, you know, for just from soft drinks in general, can create that imbalance. And then the individuals who are living off of coffee. I mean, I have so, some women I've worked with and it's like, okay, so what did you eat? And, and they're not even eating a meal till three o'clock where that's usually some like goldfish crackers, but the rest of the day, it's basically coffee, 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 coffee. And then they have one meal at the end of the day. So how are we going to get the nutrients we need for any part um, of our body to work? 
So um, I often, what I do is I create recipes that combine some of the key ingredients, right? So just to make it easy, and it's not about one single, single recipe per se, but I do like to incorporate things that for me might be considered unconventional. Like I will do like a lot of people have heard about ashwagandha. Ashwagandha can be very good for increasing um, bone tissue and, and, and helping with bone cells. Why? Because it lowers stress in the body. But how many people are having an ashwagandha ginger smoothie bowl for breakfast? Not many, right? Because they're like, oh, I'll just go take my ashwagandha supplement. But what, what if you started incorporating it into your regular every day? So you're getting little bits of it every day instead of this one big surge, right? It's the same thing with like the weekend warriors who go do their one workout on the weekend and the rest of the week they're, they're sitting around. Uh, your body is actually going to benefit from 10 to 15 minute short workout during the week because there's effects, chemicals that are happening in the body throughout that week, as opposed to on the weekend with that one workout, right? So um, another ingredient, turmeric, right? So the curcumin in the turmeric is also very beneficial because it's known to lower inflammation and it can actually lower bone reabsorption, right? So... Uh, like I said, I've already said I eat turmeric almost every day. Uh, I think my, my newsletter just had a turmeric latte golden milk recipe come out. But what if you were to make a turmeric tofu and lentil salad, right? You've got three ingredients there, turmeric, tofu, and lentils, all which would be beneficial for bone health, right? Um, so now we've got bone health, healthy breakfast, bone healthy lunch. And what could we do for dinner? Seaweed. We often don't think about incorporating seaweed as often, right? So um, seaweed snacks or maybe even a seaweed and vegetable stir fry. So really using food as medicine, the way it was meant to be, not food just to eat food. Really thinking of these different ingredients and the, the diversity and different plants. All There's even ingredients in there we don't even have the names for, you know, thousands and thousands of chemicals in there and how do you get them you get them from diversity and for somebody who is stuck in the i've eaten the same thing every day for decades same breakfast same lunch that's probably those are probably the ones that people stick to the most and maybe they'll have a little bit of variation with dinner but you can just make one little change at a time right or mm -hmm. introduce one little food at a time try that out see if it works for you and if it does, great. Keep moving forward in that direction. I know uh, you mentioned that um, I actually want to make sure I, I I know we're kind of closing out on our time here, but this has been this has been fantastic. Uh, this has been great. I've seen some things that I've I've never seen before through your demonstration and uh, just learned some things from you as well. And I'm sure our audience has too. And I'd love for them to know how you specifically help people and work with people and then where can they where can they find you? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I um, have a telehealth practice that I work with individuals so they can find me at my website, drbenote.com. Really, I help them take their habits, which always has a bad connotation, um, and turn them into lifestyle rituals um, and really being intentional with their life and what they're doing in their 24 hours of the day. And one of the uh, best places to get started with that, of course, is my book, The Anatomy of Wellbeing. So that kind of helps you get started. And then on social media, all the platforms, um, YouTube, uh, Instagram, um, all of them, I'm at Dr. Benoit. So really easy to find me. Fantastic. So we'll link to uh, your resources in the show notes. And for everybody listening, you can find all the resources, show notes, everything we talked about here today over at bonecoach.com. And we'll link to uh, that link in the show notes as well. But I just want to thank you again for so much for your time and everybody for listening. We'll see you in the next episode. Hey, it's Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. Hope you found that episode helpful and that you enjoyed it. Just one last reminder, if you haven't done so already, head over to bonecoach.com, sign up for your free seven-day osteoporosis kickstart. It's gonna tell you everything you need to do to start getting on the path to improvement. Hope you found this helpful. I'm your Bone Coach Kevin Ellis. I'll see you soon.